so the person who handles this request is not available at the moment. Would you mind calling back later on today? They are the lords of Hollywood for the most part, and they yield a lot of power. And God forbid you should buck that power, you will immediately be labeled as being anti-Semitic and not part of the crowd, the in crowd. And that's just the way it is. Uh, um, yeah, the person who we're trying to reach, uh, they're currently at lunch time right now. Can you go ahead and call back a little after 2.30? <laughs> Movies are just entertainment. You know, don't take it too seriously. Uh, that is one of Hollywood's big lies. Yeah, they're still not back from lunch. Nepotism is hiring someone because they're family. Cronyism is hiring someone because they're friends. Uh, favoritism is hiring someone because, based on some arbitrary factor that you favor. Well, we, we, it's just simply that we cannot uh, accept unsolicited material. Uh, what would be the reaction of many people in Hollywood today if all of a sudden we said, you know, 60% of the upper management in Hollywood and the top level executives are Christians? What would be the reaction to that? The mainstream media, a powerful machine that's somehow terraforming the political, economic, and cultural landscape of America. And we see this every day in the movies and nightly news, a continuous assault on traditional values and important principles set forth in the U.S. Constitution. Unfortunately, few of us understand what's happening because those who are paid to inform us are actually paid to keep their mouths shut. For were the anchors or celebrities who work for the networks and studios to make the mainstream media the issue, or were they to say the wrong thing, they would be fired or blacklisted? Given these realities, the documentary you are about to see will probably not be coming to a theater near you. And the reason for this is because we will be pulling back the curtain to see why the mainstream media is indeed the issue. We will now see how Hollywood movies and the New York media create what could be called a restraint of trade in the marketplace of ideas. The marketplace of ideas concept is really one of the underlying principles of our democracy. And the idea is that if we do not restrict the flow of information and ideas that, uh, that are available for a particular discussion, a public discourse, some issue that is of importance to, uh, to the country, uh, we're more likely to come up with the, the best idea or the truth. Well, restraint of trade actually takes you back to what is the standard of trade. And generally in the history of this country, it's been the concept of the free market, open competition. So therefore, restraint of trade is anything that infringes upon open competition and limits the freedom of the market. This applies to, to the film industry in the sense that uh, to the extent that we narrow the, the availability of ideas, then the film industry in effect is diminishing the, the strength of our democracy. And we will see why the mainstream media promotes the globalist agenda, an agenda that sanctifies free trade, has destroyed the U.S. manufacturing base, bled the American middle class of jobs, corrupted the family unit, tolerated fiat currency and encourages infringement of the Second Amendment so completely 
we the people are increasingly subject to the very terror the mainstream media helps generate every evening on the nightly news. The agenda is to build what they like to call a new world order. The new world order is world government based on the model of collectivism. In its essence, collectivism is a political and social system. It's the kind of system that Adolf Hitler had in mind, that Lenin had in mind, Stalin and Mao Zedong. So the globalist agenda, in my view, is not a good thing. It's an agenda for world enslavement. But before we get into these issues, let's take a quick look at the history of the Hollywood movies. What would grow into radio, television, and cable networks to collectively become the mainstream media? a term that refers to any program that's produced and or distributed by the major studios or networks and seen by a wide audience. Hi, so I just found out that the person who handles this call on vacation and won't be back until next week. The movie industry has a history as rich and intriguing as any of the movies it's ever produced. What's more, America may not have become the great nation it is today without the vision of the Jewish immigrants who established the movie industry. These were the original movie moguls, many of whom started out in Manhattan's Lower East Side and later moved west. Unlike the world they grew up in, the moguls entered an America of robust nuclear families headed by strong fathers, doting neo-Victorian mothers, and happy children. Most Americans were from one-income Christian families that constituted a strong and growing middle class. The American dream was liberty, the freedom to worship God, to raise our families. That was the American dream. And I think over the years, uh, the focus has changed. And I think that the emphasis now on materialism was not the original dream of the Founding Fathers. And quite frankly, I think it's very important that we get back to the uh, original dream of the Founders, which was liberty. Even though the business establishment at turn-of-the-century America was somewhat discriminating, if not anti-Semitic, the movie moguls took the high road. They created their own businesses, including the first Nickelodeons, theaters, and motion picture production companies. The movies they would go on to produce ignored the bad and built on what was good about America. Not only did the moguls want to assimilate, they made movies that got us through the Great Depression and the World Wars, movies that uplifted us with dance and musicals, hope and visions of prosperity, art deco, romance, dreams of a better life and a glorious future. For the immigrant moguls knew what it was like to go without, and so they worked ever harder to inspire an America to go in style, to have good dads, loving mothers, responsible children, a respect for religion, productivity, innovation, low debt, and a higher standard of living for each generation. The original movies were very, very uh, promotional of a new dream, a new country, a new way of life. They were respectful of traditional values, and they, in many ways, not only promoted the American dream, but established what many people adopted as the American dream. Their wholesome and imaginative black and white movies, TV shows, and nightly news inspired America to become greater than anyone ever dreamed. Unfortunately, not everyone found the mogul's vision uplifting. Thomas Edison, inventor of the motion picture camera, used ruthless collection tactics for royalties on his patents. So much so, he eventually forced the moguls to leave town. And they did, to a sunny suburb of Los Angeles that became known as Hollywood. So you'd have to say they were probably wrong in doing that. But uh, Edison, on the other hand, hired thugs to run after these independent producers, sometimes referred to as the outlaw producers, and uh, beat them up or assault them. And so this is one of the reasons that is sometimes cited as a reason for the founding of Hollywood. They also needed the sunlight because the exposure index of films of the day was very, very low, somewhere around an ASA of something like five or eight, as opposed to today's films, which are at 250 and 500 ASA. So being close to the Mexican border to get away from Edison's patent thugs and having plenty of sunlight and reliable weather out in Hollywood land 
were the reasons that the movie moguls left New York City and basically set up five movie studios and four mini-majors in the area of Los Angeles. There, far from Edison's patent police, but near the Mexican border, the moguls built an even more glamorous industry than what they had left back east. For what kid hasn't marveled at Hollywood movies? The silver screen with its mind-boggling action adventures and the endearing romances of our favorite stars. And now, a global industry. What nation has not benefited from Hollywood movies? What people have not been able to feel closer to other people, especially when we realize that we are more alike than different? People feel closer to people who they have met, may have never met by virtue of seeing a story about someone they don't know, but you know has aspects of their life that matches the lives they live. The technology of film uh, and television is just another way of people telling stories to each other. Yes, the movie moguls would go on to present an idealized vision of the American dream and even build an empire of their own. In his book, An Empire of Their Own, Neil Gabler explains how these mostly Jewish immigrants came here. A lot of them had dysfunctional families, bad dads, and they made movies that reflected a more idealized scene, a scene that they would have liked to have seen. And now, a hundred years later, this empire creates thousands of hours of movies and TV shows every year. The production output from hundreds of companies a cornucopia of human thought now on everyone's fingertips. Unfortunately, this cornucopia is but an illusion. Fifty shades of gray, but little or no color. It seems that we have a cornucopia of media with different views, but in reality, in spite of the fact that we've got different networks and different channels and maybe a hundred different options on our television sets, if you look at the viewpoints of the mainstream of those channels anyway, they're all pretty much the same. So it's an illusion that we have a lot of choices. It's the same kind of an illusion when you, when you uh, look at political parties, for example. Uh, it's uh, the feeling that, well, we've got the Republicans or the Democrats here in the United States, and that certainly is a choice, isn't it? And there are choices, of course, on viewpoints on a lot of minor issues, but on the really big issues like American sovereignty, the Federal Reserve System, which is a banking cartel. Those issues are not a point of debate uh, or a different point of view at all of these different news channels that we talk about and we think, oh, we've got all of our choices. Yeah, they'll talk about a lot of little things, but the really important issues are not even up for discussion. We have been trying for 10 years to address every outlet of the mainstream media has received our DVD, our petition calling for a new investigation with 2,500 architects and engineers, but we don't get any reporting from that. As we will more fully explore, certain issues, subjects, stories, and whole populations are now ignored, invalidated, vilified, and defamed every time we turn on a TV or watch a movie. In fact, from our teens to our 40s, the Hollywood movies now indoctrinate us with all manner of violence and propaganda. And then, from our 40s onward, the New York media riddles us with a narrow spectrum of anti-constitutional liberal news from almost every outlet. Let's take a look at the structure of the mainstream media and shed some light on why this happened, how it restricts our speech, and how it promotes a globalist agenda that's destroyed the American dream. Yes, unfortunately he's filming, so we wouldn't be able to do it within the next month. Today's mainstream media is comprised of hundreds, if not thousands, of media companies. These media companies are engaged in the production of motion pictures, news broadcasts, TV programs, documentaries, and advertisements. As mentioned, one would think this cornucopia of media companies would be delivering a cornucopia of diverse news, entertainment, information, and ideas. After all, these media companies are peppered across the nation from coast to coast. Unfortunately, as widespread as they are, almost all of them are owned by basically six multinational corporations, what's known as conglomerates. A conglomerate involves a situation in which one corporation 
will own a number of other corporations in different areas of economic activity, but they will be, all be controlled by the head of the conglomerate. These conglomerates are Comcast, Disney, Sony, Time Warner, 21st Century Fox, and Viacom. So, rather than having hundreds of independent media companies across the nation, we essentially have just six. Collectively, the six conglomerates thus control almost all of the programming in the United States. Over the last uh, 50 years, there's been a tremendous consolidation of the mass media. It's gone from over 100 companies to six major companies. In the process, these companies have started to overlook major items of news, especially when it respects or has an application to their financial well-being. Shows like The History Channel, Good Morning America, Colbert Report, Face the Nation, The O'Reilly Factor, Morning Joe, Meet the Press, Fareed Zakaria, Rachel Maddow, and Barbara Walter Special are all financed, produced, and or distributed by the conglomerates. But the crowning jewel for each of the six conglomerates is their ownership of one of the six major movie studios. The term major Hollywood movie studio is a very large corporation usually, which makes a lot of motion pictures and employs a great number of people in all disciplines of the movie making process. These studios are known as the MPAA Studios and they are Universal Studios, The Walt Disney Company, Sony Pictures, Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, and Paramount Pictures. There are independent studios. There are very productive studios in North Carolina, for instance. Uh, there are studios all over the country, in Arizona and whatnot, where movies are shot. But the MPAA, the big studios, are members of the Motion Picture Association, and they are primarily in Hollywood. These six Hollywood-based movie studios produce and or distribute movies watched by about 95% of the viewing public. And most of this audience is comprised of young people. If you add up that market share, it'll come close to 90% uh, on, in any given year. And then I, I suppose the major studio distributors weren't satisfied with just approaching 90%. So almost all of them either bought or created wholly owned subsidiaries that uh, engage in competing with the independents for the lower budget films, you know, things below 20 million. And if you add them all up together, you're getting up to 95% or so each year for the market share of the major studios and their wholly owned subsidiaries. At the same time, older Americans are treated to the homogenized output of just six New York-based news networks. We all know them as CBS, NBC, ABC, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News. This is where we the voters get 95% of our news. Given this state of affairs, the savvy citizen may ask, how has such a small group of corporations been able to dominate the entire mainstream media? And the answer is the few have control over large quantities of money. They have control over credit. Uh, they have control over banking, money issue as a matter of fact. And we're talking now about the banking fraternity. And if you look on the boards of directors of the great media corporations, you see an interlock with banking institutions. So money is the answer to the question. And a long time ago, they decided that to control the thinking of the population, it was necessary to take over and control the media. Let's consult some more history. Previously, we saw that Hollywood was founded by a small group of European immigrants who wanted a better life for all. These movie moguls numbered only about 20, but they founded five major studios and four mini-major studios between 1912 and 1935. The original major studios that were formed in Hollywood were Paramount Pictures, RKL, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, Warner Brothers, and 20th Century Fox. Believe it or not, Universal Studios used to be considered a mini-major. So the mini-majors were Universal Studios, United Artists, and Columbia Pictures. There were also some minor studios, and those minor studios were Disney, Monogram, and Republic. With the formation of these studios, Hollywood grew and prospered beyond imagination. 
Back East, Edison produced a series of short, mediocre films. The Great Train Robbery in 1903 was possibly the only exception. As competition on both coasts continued, Edison sent his patent police west in an attempt to shut down the Hollywood moguls for movie camera theft. However, by 1915, when Edison's production company went bankrupt, audiences were loving Hollywood movies so much, nothing ever came of the patent lawsuits. The independent producers eventually sued the Edison Trust, or Edison, and prevailed in the courts, and so therefore got their freedom to go and continue to use their uh, movie-making equipment without uh, having to pay license fees to him because he went overboard in engaging thugs to uh, collect his money. And as the studios prospered, actors, writers, filmmakers, and people from every vocation flocked into Hollywood to get a job in the talkies. And they did. It was the studio system, a vast industrial complex of vertically integrated motion picture production, distribution, and exhibition entities. The studio system was basically a factory for motion pictures. It was put together by the original movie moguls, and they built a dream factory, whereby they created an assembly line type process of making motion pictures. Hundreds of them a year, each studio, and the appetite across the country was insatiable. As glamorous as the film business may seem to many people, the studio system is a business. And these studios are run with precision and they're power-based, not unlike Wall Street or any other big, they are corporations. So the studio system, for instance, when I was placed under contract at 20th Century Fox, I was a member of a family, a proud member, and they did go to extreme lengths to keep us happy. The studio system ensured that all the actors, writers, directors, producers were pretty much employed from picture to picture, so they were able to focus on their art rather than on money in the ad hoc system like we have today. By the mid-1930s, the studio system had spawned over 17,000 movie theaters across the nation, and 60 million of the nation's 130 million people went to the movies every week. It was the golden age of Hollywood. Yes, even millionaires like Joseph Kennedy and Howard Hughes caught the movie bug. Everyone wanted to produce movies and tell their unique stories. And many great stories were told. The 1930s alone produced All Quiet on the Western Front, King Kong, Mutiny on the Bounty, Modern Times, Snow White, The Wizard of Oz, and Gone with the Wind. To me, a director is only as good as the story he has, and only as good as the talent he has in front of the, in front of the cameras. Yes, I go, what shall I do? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. But just as it seemed Hollywood's flame could blaze no brighter, Politicians in the Eastern establishment, possibly encouraged by a spiteful Edison, hit the movie moguls with a series of blows. So I just checked into his schedule, and unfortunately, it's just not something that we'll be able to accommodate at this time. Known as the Paramount case, the first blow was in 1938, when the Justice Department sued the five major studios and ordered them to stop block booking and blind bidding. The basic idea of the Paramount case was that the big studios were engaged in monopolistic practices uh, involving distribution of films, involving control over theaters, and what the Supreme Court was looking into was the set of practices that the studios were engaged in. Were these practices creating monopolies or were they tending to create monopolies? Block booking is forcing theater owners to buy packages of movies containing mediocre films in order to get the hit films. Block booking is really no different than what we have today called bundling. In other words, they bundle cable with internet, with telephone, and they call it bundle. Now, maybe you're not forced to take all three of those things, but 50 channels and you really only want one cable channel or five cable channels, and yet you're forced to take all these other ones, you can't pick your channels a la carte in any kind of a competitive manner where the channels would compete with each other. You basically have to take the whole package of channels. If you wanted Gone with the Wind, you had to take Angry Red Planet or a bunch of other movies that you really didn't want to watch. 
Blind bidding is forcing theaters to buy these same packages sight unseen. The suit was partially resolved in 1940 with a consent decree, which allowed the government to reinstate the suit if the studios didn't comply. Unfortunately, the studios did not comply, and in 1943, the case went back to trial and was appealed all the way to the Supreme Court by 1948. The Supreme Court was looking at the question of whether vertical integration between the producers of movies and the distributors of movies, the exhibitors of movies, if you will, the theaters, were creating a monopoly situation. Here, the High Court affirmed most of the consent decree's terms, but also ordered the movie moguls to sell their theaters. This single action by the U.S. government, known as divestiture, destroyed the Hollywood studio system and thus ended the golden age of Hollywood. Since the studios were never again able to reliably sell their product, they were never again able to reliably contract talented new writers, actors, directors, producers, or production crews with steady employment. Here's a conspiracy theory for you. You know, Mel Gibson would even love this one. Edison and Henry Ford got together and basically either instigated or nursed along the Justice Department's Paramount case. Edison and uh, Ford may have been a little jealous of the movie moguls, and it's well-known fact that the Eastern establishment was pretty anti-Semitic back in these days. So Edison and Ford may have had something to do with the Justice Department's consent decree. Here is a perfect example of the unintended consequences of government destroying the delicate economy of an entire industry. Free market economists look at the antitrust laws and say, the antitrust laws themselves are an attempt to limit free market activity in an unjustifiable way from an economic point of view. The movie moguls had their theaters, their showrooms, chopped off in the name of the evils of vertical integration. Edison and Ford, on the other hand, still had their showrooms for their products, their record players and automobiles. Even though the 1940s saw some great movies, The Philadelphia Story, Fantasia, Grapes of Wrath, Citizen Kane, Casablanca, It's a Wonderful Life, 12 O'Clock High, the Hollywood studios were headed for still more icebergs. After World War II, television burst upon the scene, and by 1950, this new invention fostered a serious drop in movie ticket sales. Television took a lot of people out of theaters and left them sitting at home watching television. Uh, the feature film, you know, uh, was still the bailiwick of the, of the film of the theater. Um, but a after the, the introduction of television, um, there were less uh, short films and other, uh, you know, non-feature works that were done uh, in Hollywood to be exhibited in theaters. The movie moguls reacted by circling the wagons and initiating massive liquidations. First, they sold off their priceless collections of props and wardrobes from 50 years of movies that had changed Americans forever. Then they sold off their real estate. Back lots were movies like Sunset Boulevard, High Noon, White Christmas, Oklahoma, Bridge on the River Kwai, and Ben-Hur were filmed. Add to these sad events the escalating massive unemployment due to the breakup of the studio system and Hollywood talent, staff, and crews were desperate. Eventually, the stars realized they could survive better if they were not under contract to any particular studio. Thus was born the star system, a tough, brutal system where talent fees escalated into the millions and the studios suffered even more. So suddenly the stars, instead of being loyal to any given studio, were free agents. They were basically hired guns. They'd go from studio to studio, picture to picture, and their agents would basically negotiate for them. In essence, we had the business community injecting itself into the creative community because if you have agents sitting there basically screening out potential screenplays, then you've got business people screening out the 
creativity of the thousands of writers all across the country. Now that creates oftentimes a lot of friction between the creators, the writers, directors, makeup artists, producers, actors, and the business people, if you will, because business and creativity, business and art, don't really go hand in hand. It was only a matter of time before the moguls had to turn to outside financial help. At this time, we can't say yes. You could try calling back later on this year and see what the status is then. In Hollywood parlance, an outsider is a wealthy individual or business entity that is attracted to the glitz and glamour of the movie business and wants to participate. At first, individual outsiders like Kirk Kerkorian, Lawrence Gordon, Dino De Laurentiis, Marvin Davis, Ted Turner, and Rupert Murdoch came to Hollywood to seek their fortune as producers. Well, there's a long history of of wealthy individuals usually or very talented individuals coming from all over the world and certainly the United States to Hollywood seeking fame and fortune. And these include people like D.W. Griffith who was an early uh, director on the East Coast and did very well and uh, went out to, to Hollywood and didn't do so well. Uh, he was followed by Joseph P. Kennedy, John Kennedy's father. And he was out in Hollywood for a while and tried his hand at it and didn't do so well. But individuals only had so much money, and since movies are expensive and difficult to produce, individual outsiders usually ended up broke and then ejected from the Hollywood club. So the moguls turned their attention to corporate investors. Thus, from the 1960s onward, the studios would get in bed with the wolves of Wall Street. Corporations like Golf and Western, Coca-Cola, Transamerica, Westinghouse, Matsushita, the Vendi and Seagram's snorted up the Hollywood studios like cocaine. Led by greedy agents, they also became drunk on power and demanded more and more creative control. The screenwriter or the director are usually adamant about having creative control because it is their canvas that the scenario is being painted on. Rembrandt and Picasso would not like me coming up and taking his brush stroke and trying to initiate a new brush stroke to alter his canvas. Understandably, the Hollywood studios needed money to make films, but they didn't want unqualified businessmen telling them how to make them. Thus, the successors to the savvy movie moguls that once ran the studios as works of art would have to adapt or fight their new corporate masters. Creative control of the movie industry was now at stake. You can't query a studio anymore to see if they want to see your script. This has been relegated to the agents, and the agents sit there basically deciding what scripts will be submitted to Hollywood. You're taking 20,000 scripts written every year, subjecting them to the, the business mentality of the agents, and then only those scripts can get submitted to studios. The creative process of Hollywood studios has been totally preempted by agents, lawyers, and business people. He has so many previous commitments already that we are looking at several years down the line. As corporate ownership of the studios became more prevalent, the battle for creative control became more intense and finally gave rise to a new camp known as the Hollywood Insider. The term Hollywood Insider refers to a small group of people who occupy the most important or most powerful positions in Hollywood. But the main focus of it is on the studio executives, the top studio executives at the major studio distributors. That's the real core of the Hollywood control group or the Hollywood Insiders. People who for one reason or another by circumstance have uh, either bullied their way or earned their way into positions uh, such that they can be very intimidating to people who are on the outside. A Hollywood insider is any person who is a major star, director, writer, producer, powerful agent, personal manager, attorney, or a member of what could be called traditional management. 
The term traditional management originates from the idea that certain management teams consist of a preponderance of executives that are related to the original movie moguls, their families, and or close associates. Traditional management is another one of those terms that, that's related to Hollywood Insider, Hollywood Control Group, Hollywood Establishment, but it's sort of, by choice of words, it sort of implies, well, there's a long-standing traditional group of people who uh, run Hollywood and control basically which films are produced and released by the major studio distributors, which are in turn the films seen by most people in the U.S. and around the world. Thus to understand how traditional management has been able to win the creative control battle against the money men, we have to look at a tactic known as the mass exodus. Over time, if there are conflicts between the, the corporate owner of the, the studio and this Hollywood insider management that they've hired, then the insider management group sometimes would use the threat of a mass exodus. In other words, everybody's going to leave at one time if you don't do what we say. <laughs> that sort of thing is a threat, and that actually occurred in the history of Hollywood used against outside corporate interests. For instance, when Transamerica Corporation bought United Artists, Arthur Krim, Mike Metavoy, and other executives left and formed Orion Pictures. Orion became a well-regarded studio under such leadership as Barbara Boyle, whereas United Artists floundered. Another example of a mass exodus is when Alan Ladd Jr. left 20th Century Fox when oil billionaire Marvin Davis bought it. They didn't like the way Davis was basically managing the place even though he was the owner. Fox had major problems. Given these experiences and many other mass exoduses, Hollywood insiders have been able to defeat the money men. Creative control gave rise to what could be called the Hollywood Control Group. Thus, he who had the know-how and creative control ruled the movie business. The creative parties in a motion picture want creative control. The people who are bringing the money to the motion picture want ownership control. The creative people in the film industry want creative control because they want to make the film that they envision for their finished production. Whereas the owners, they want something that will give them the greatest revenue. Well, we can, we, it's just simply that we cannot uh, accept unsolicited material. As the Hollywood Control Group became increasingly reliant on outside financing, yet harassed by conglomerate ownership, it began to circle the wagons and stick together more than ever. I think the phrase control group is generally used to describe a small group of people that have great influence over some uh, activity or some celebrity or some powerful political figure. They're usually in the background. So I think that's what we're talking about when we use the phrase a control group. It's these people in the background who represent a lot of money and also who have a very strong political and ideological objective. To the outside world, the new corporate executives, who were replacing the movie moguls and even traditional management, seemed cold and less sensitive to traditional American values. There was money to be made and an agenda to be kept. The Hollywood control group was becoming predatory, unethical, and even engaged in illegal business practices. Competition is, to a certain extent, always predatory. Company A is trying to gain a greater market share over company B by producing a better product or a cheaper product or a product that is better advertised or whatever, trying to gain that advantage. And eventually, company B is going to be removed from the process. And one could look at that and say, well, that's predatory. But it's predatory in a good sense because it increases efficiency and consumer satisfaction and so forth and so on. If we're talking about predation that is unethical or illegal, that's exactly the opposite side of the coin. It's an attempt to remove or limit the ability of a, com of a competitor to function through some kind of unethical, immoral, improper in that sense, or sufficiently illegal activity. Yes, the new Hollywood is nothing like the old Hollywood, and the new movies are nothing like the old movies. In fact, by the 1960s, movies with violent and shocking images had become standard. Psychologists might even say Hollywood is now dramatizing all the negative things that have happened to it and its founders, everything from theatrical divestiture to the Holocaust. Most of the people in the mainstream media, Hollywood, studio system, 
their demure to this whole thing has always been and is now, look, we're just businessmen. We're just making money. We're just out to make a buck, okay? We don't care how we do it, okay? And if in the process people think that we're biased or, or our, our movies are slanted towards some abstract political philosophy that nobody can really define, you know, that's just fine. Let them think that. Because the bottom line is people are going to buy our tickets to see our movies or they're not. The Hollywood studios became violence-oriented, less tolerant, and politically correct. And now these dramatizations have been institutionalized and funneled through just six conglomerates, which own and amplify everything. The real power is in the hands of the top three studio executives, the people who have green light authority over which movies are produced and uh, released. And that's the chairman of the board, some of whom are more active than others uh, over time, and then the uh, president of the studio and the head of production. Three top executives in each of the six studios, plus three top executives in each of the six networks, plus three top executives in each of the six conglomerates, and that equals 54. 54 top executives in all. This could now be called the control group of the U.S. mass media oligopoly. The U.S. mass media oligopoly, which can be said to be comprised of the six conglomerates, the six studios, and the six networks, is basically dominated by 54 males of European heritage. 2% female, six, six women uh, over time have served as studio executives in those three powerful positions. And it turns out again that almost 100% are white. I did a massive amount of research, spent a lot of time over at the UCLA Entertainment Studies and spent a lot of time over at the Academy Library, uh, which actually had these big 8 by 11 envelopes filled with press clippings on each of these individuals. And so I ended up with this chart, filling in this chart, and the result was that Hollywood is controlled, if you assume that the power really is in the hands of these studio executives, which I did, uh, that Hollywood is controlled by a small group of politically liberal, not very religious Jewish males of European heritage. And anybody can observe that and report that. Uh, USC School of Journalism and Communications just came out this year with a study confirming that Hollywood was sorely lacking in diversity in terms of race, gender, and, and uh, ethnicity. But before one can understand how either the Hollywood control group or the oligopoly control group are promoting the globalist agenda and undermining founding principles, one must understand something about the influences that hit Hollywood shortly after the original movie moguls passed away. Karl Marx believed that you would have uh, a rebellion by the workers uh, against uh, the capitalist system, which would then create uh, a Marxist uh, communist society in the wealthiest and most industrialized countries. It never happened. When the workers of the world did not unite behind Lenin's economic political Marxism, certain political scientists got together in Frankfurt, Germany and formed a research center they called the Institute for Social Research. Later known as the Frankfurt School, this group of Marxist philosophers tried to figure out why the workers of the world did not unite behind economic political Marxism. As Max Horkheimer, one of the school's founders, put it, Marx got it all wrong. The workers are not up to being the vanguard of the communist revolution. Let's translate Marxism into cultural terms. By cultural terms, Horkheimer meant cultural institutions like the movies. Workers of the world were more united by the movies they watched than the economic and political institutions they supported. Every single major mainstream institution has been influenced heavily by uh, culture Marxism, which is at the core uh, of this movement. This has been a, an assault on the very character and nature of our country. 
America was born not as a Marxist nation, but as a, a nation of liberty and a nation of law, a nation that respected the laws of God, the, the natural laws of God, the revealed laws of God. Cultural Marxism is, is polar opposite of those values. And since they have taken over, for the most part, the major mainstream institutions of America, now we are literally inundated with cultural Marxism to the point that that we have a generation today that probably wouldn't even recognize it as cultural Marxism, they would recognize it as norm. Given this turn of events, the Frankfurt School reasoned that the movie industry and all other cultural institutions had to be infiltrated and destroyed. George Lukacs. I see the revolutionary destruction of society as the one and only solution. A worldwide overturning of values cannot take place without the annihilation of the old values and the creation of the new ones by the revolutionaries. So to get to that point, they said we have to destroy the culture and what they were talking about was the Christian culture, uh, what we used to call Christendom or Western civilization. As fate would have it, many of the Frankfurt School's leading lights had to leave for America when World War II broke out. Now safe in New York at places like Columbia University, the school's social engineers began applying their techniques to each new crop of studio executives emerging from the nation's Ivy League colleges. Antonio Granzi, one of the notable leaders of the Frankfurt School, put it this way. The civilized world has been thoroughly saturated with Christianity for 2,000 years. Any country grounded in Judeo-Christian values cannot, therefore, be overthrown until those roots are cut. Gramsci actually uh, argued with a lot of his fellow communists who wanted to take control physically. He said, no, no, the way to do it is to march through the institutions, march through the churches and through the uh, schools and through the, the, the media, through the, the, the culture. And uh, he actually was in prison and he wrote a book that outlined his thinking and his thinking has been adopted by a lot of people. And sure enough, the long march eventually saturated the youthful minds of even the Hollywood control group. Screenplays and movies of every possible anti-Christian, anti-family and anti-capitalist theme now poured forth from Hollywood. And the long march didn't infect just the Hollywood movie studios. It hit the new radio and TV industries, the theater, the music industry, book and magazine publishing industries, the public school system, and even the clergy. In the first part of the 20th century, through the middle part of the 20th century, there were a lot of pastors and, and clergymen and ministers that saw this coming, and they did speak out against it. Unfortunately, as you got into the second half of the 20th century, uh, the clergy, the ministers, the pastors became much more oriented toward success. Big buildings, big crowds, uh, big offerings. Uh, it became a success-driven ministry as opposed to a truth-driven ministry. And so for the second half of the 20th century and now into the 21st century, the resistance of the clergy and of the church in general is almost non-existent. Yes, during this long march, traditional values would be replaced with Marxist values, a worldwide overturning of values as Lukacs had promised. Eventually, only what's politically correct was to remain. Political correctness is thus the attempt to use speech to control thought and behavior. It's an extension of the Marxist doctrine of equality, but applied to speech. Make speech equally acceptable, tolerable to all people, and thought and behavior can be universally controlled as well. What that really means is that you're only allowed to express or even hold viewpoints that are accepted in a very narrow box. These are accepted and approved viewpoints. And if you have viewpoints outside of that, you'll be demonized and attacked and marginalized. What's happened to us? It's sad Berkeley was the epicenter of the free speech movement in the 60s, holding a sign outside, outside of the archway. Now it is becoming the epicenter of the no free speech movement. 
and, you know, just advocating, speaking like the founding fathers, advocating limited government, advocating that the government be bound by the Constitution, and advocating that, you know, police officers and, and members of the military have an obligation and duty to refuse unlawful orders, for example. Even that alone is considered to be outside the bound. Uh, if you're told that something is incorrect and therefore you must not speak about it, the implication is that the reason you shouldn't speak about it or use certain words is because it's bad. Well, if it's bad, then if you have those thoughts and you think that it was okay, then there's something wrong with you. You see what I'm trying to say? The implication is, especially if you're just a child in school and you're picking up this concept of political correctness as a child, you're being taught not only what is acceptable, but you're being taught of what is right and wrong. And therefore, you are absorbing the values, the cultural values, the mores of those who are setting the standards. And nowhere is politically correct thought and behavior more controlled than academia, and it spawned the new corporate Hollywood. Yes, totalitarian in nature, political correctness is not only an enemy of free speech, it's literally a synonym for cultural Marxism itself. And Hollywood was infected big time.